Hey everybody, it's Pastor Tony from the River Church Baltimore. I'm so pumped, so excited that you would join us tonight. Tonight is going to be fire from heaven. You better get ready. I believe the Lord is going to heal people tonight and change people's lives from this dynamic message from the Lord. Listen, do me a quick favor. Take your phone out or your computer, whatever it might be that you're watching, and start sharing this as many different Facebook groups, friends. And even as I'm preaching tonight, you can type in different names and uh, they can pop up. But listen, tonight is going to be fire. And also, if you're ever in the area, if you're in Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Maryland, D.C., Virginia, you can come join us, 32 West Road, Towson, Maryland, 1030. It's going to be fire, and then we have services throughout the week. You can check us out on riverchurchbaltimore.com. But listen, we'll be right back after this message. We'll see you soon. Bless you. The title of my message today is Dominion Reigning in the Last Days. How many know we're in the last days? <laughs> I, I, when you watch the news and you watch everything that's going on, the compression of time is, is ridiculous. There was a, a, a man in here, a great man of God, actually had a vision, and he said, uh, in this dream, Jesus appeared to him, and his eyes were closed, and then he opened up his eyes, and he said he saw the world begin to spin out of control. Well, how many know the time clock is ar around the spinning of the world? I mean, there's, there's appropriate time, and even when people did time and, you know, the, the pyramids and all the, the little sculptures and all that, they would base it off of time about how the earth spins around the sun. Well, he, he saw in this vision, this dream, that the earth was spinning radically, meaning time is speeding up. And then he saw Jesus' eyes open, then he knew that was it. Jesus was coming back. We are living in the last days. But how many know in the last days we don't need to be in a bunker in West Virginia eating beans and burritos? Can you say amen? <laughs> and thank God for beans and burritos, but you can't eat that all the time. How many know that? But the reality is, is I want to encourage you that this is a great time to be alive. You know, the world says this is the worst time, all hell's breaking loose, but this is a time for us to rule and reign as Christ. The Bible even talks about the second coming to encourage people with these words, not in a discouragement, not, not, oh, this is going to be bad. No, it's actually the greatest time of life to actually be alive. God, think about this. God has kept you for the last days. How many know that? And God has put something on the inside of you to use you to take dominion in the last days. Not to be under the devil's head or, oh man, he's taken over. No, it's time for us. God has put something on the inside of every one of you to engage and take warfare and take the kingdom of darkness out and bring in the marvelous light. Can you say amen? amen. The word of the Lord, and I, I kept saying this over and over, and I went back to this, and I was sitting right here on a Wednesday night, and this is when the elections were taking place and all these crazy stuff uh, was going on with the news and headlines. And even now, if you watch the news, how many know it is just it's bad news? But how many know we have good news? Praise God. Thank God for a good news. Thank God we have a good news. Channel 5, Channel 4, Chapter 5, Chapter 4. You, you can turn in any of them and they can give you good news. Everybody shout good news. The gospel is actually good news. It's good news for us. It's bad news for the unbeliever. Uh, but when I was sitting right there, I felt like a weight come on me. But how many know as a, as, a, as a citizen of the kingdom, you know, you might have a weight, but you can't live with that weight. You can't allow feelings to dictate how you feel. How many know that? You have to push feelings off of you and continue to be in faith. So anyways, I was pushing this feeling that I had on me because I'm like, God, we just started this church. You know, the devil's coming. All hell's breaking loose. They're trying to shut everything down. How many know that? They're trying to just collapse everything, cause a one-world government, one-world agenda. I mean, everything. It, the book of Revelations is being revealed right before our eyes. So anyways, I was sitting right there, and I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, I'm coming back sooner than what people think. And I heard that. I said, oh, my goodness. And then he said this, I'm going to empower my church. And when he said that, it was like a ball of fire. You guys know the story. The, it was like a ball of energy hit my spirit, and I began to laugh. I began to jump. I began to praise God. I'm like, wow. Like, I felt... A total refreshing kind of feels like, a, uh, you know, one of those game shows when you win the lottery or whatever. You know, they're sitting there watching the Powerball, and then they win the lottery. Ah, that's what I felt, but in a good way. How many know in a good way? I don't play the lottery, but if you do, uh, just break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. Amen. It's a joke. You shouldn't play the lottery. Amen. <laughs> just play with stocks and currencies. It's still the same thing. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Stop. I'll stop. But how many know we need to reign in the last days? We have to reign. We cannot hide out. This is the greatest time for the church to
to preach the gospel. This is the greatest time to heal the sick. This is the greatest time to start businesses. This is the greatest time to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have we have dominion. We have the antidote. I mean, you think about people are running around, and, and I'm not knocking anybody, but I, 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 I sure will not get that vaccine. You're like, Pastor, we got a problem. No, I'm telling you, I'm not putting that stuff in my arm. What the enemy is trying to do is he's trying to control populations. He's trying to get everybody on the same accord, and you got to take dominion. And I'm not, I'm not knocking if you did. I'm saying the globalist agenda is to collapse everything and get them under one rulership, one dictatorship, and I'm a pastor. This place is not, and I'm just going to tell you off the jump. I'm not trying to get into it, but I feel like getting into it. Everybody shout, preach, Pastor. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want the truth. I'm going to continue to go with this because pastors are afraid to tell the truth. You have to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. How many know you're responsible for God's people? I mean, I'm responsible for you. I have to tell you the truth. The devil is out to take dominion over God's people. That, that's why Pharaoh, when he saw that Moses and something was happening in the realm of the spirit, what did he do? He began to kill all the firstborn. When they saw Jesus appearing, why, why did King Herod begin to kill all the babies? Why? Because dominion, you can see the light of the gospel, and the devil knows that his time is short, and he knows that he's trying to run and scatter everybody and, and cause de, de, delusion and confusion and race baiting and all these things. Guys, we're living in the end times. More than ever, we have to stand up for what's right. Can you say amen. And we have to take back dominion. You, you know what? You have power in those hands. Somebody shout, I got power in my hands. You got power in your tongue. You got power in those eyes. You got power in those feet. We have been made for this last days to take dominion. And I believe you're going to take that. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. So those two things that he told me, he said, I'm, I'm coming back sooner than what people think, and I'm going to empower my church. And I heard this powerful testimony. How many ever heard of R.W. Shambach? Anybody? old Pentecostal tent evangelist, and what he would do is he would actually set his tent up in uh, the worst places of America. I mean, he was in Brooklyn. I mean, it's all over Chicago and the inner city. I mean, uh, he came to Baltimore, D.C. He would purposely go into the worst places, uh, and, and it would be crazy. I mean, he, I mean, I'm talking about the hood, the projects, and he would set up this big tent meeting and hit the B3 well, and, and I mean, lay hands on people, cast out devils. He went to one meeting, and, and they said they were in Brooklyn, and uh, they were cleaning up to put the tent down, and they filled a whole pickup truck full of needles, a whole entire truck, uh, not, not with trash, but with needles. That's how bad the area was. So anyways, as he was preaching, he, uh, I heard this story. When he was preaching, these gang members, uh, he, they, they would pray for the grandmas, and, the, and uh, the grandmas would come down the altar and say, hey, my son's in a gang and all this. Can you pray for him? R.W. Shambach would pray for him, and the next night, the, the son will be there, the, the gang member. Then next thing you know, the, son, the sons and all the gangs would start getting saved. So he said he was at one meeting, and uh, some religious person in the back said, hey, you're a false prophet. And all these gang members, they're saved now. They just got saved. Now they're ushers. They turn around, they're like, they're walking back. Hey, buddy, you better calm down. I don't know what a false prophet is, but that, that, that's a good man. And, I mean, literally, you're talking about taking dominion. So, anyways, R.W. Shambach was just doing this all, you know, just going for it. And then there, there was an evangelist under him named Evangelist Ted Shuttlesworth. So he took the mantle up of doing the same thing, and he still does it today. And he, he wants to do one in Baltimore. We're all going to do a big, massive one in West Baltimore, right in the, I mean, right in the crevice there. Come on. I mean, put us right there next to Plant Parenthood, crack houses, whatever. Put us right in between that thing and just let us rip. So anyways, he, um, he, he ends up in Rhode Island in a rough area, and he puts his tent up. And uh, as he puts his tent up, he's having revival meetings. I mean, things are breaking out, miracles. People are getting healed, awesome things that are happening. And then all of a sudden, one of the, the, the political leaders, I think it was a mayor or one of the executive mayor or whatever branches, he came to him and he said, hey, he said, um, Hey, we just built a, a, a nice high school up the road, and uh, it's about a half an hour away. We'd love for you to do your, your ministry under that tent, or, or under the high school. We, we'll pay for it, all that. And, our, and, uh, and uh, Evangelist Ted, he said, you know what? I, I'm not doing that. I've come to the broken. I want to come to the, the gang-infested areas. He says, I don't want to go out in the county. I want to be in the hood. And that's what he said. And then uh, the, the guy got kind of upset and walked away. Well, an hour later, another guy from county says, hey, we're shutting down this tent. And uh, he says, basically, you better take this tent up. So the guy was a con artist. He was trying to get him out of the city. So anyways, 
Uh, Evangelist Ted, this is crazy. Listen to the story. Talking about taking dominion. He sits and he begins to pray. He says, God, there has to be a way. You have called me to put this in here. You called me to preach the gospel. The thing is growing and the government wants to shut me down. All of a sudden, as he's done praying, he looks up and there's this big white um, limousine that pulls up. And uh, as this limousine pulls up, he don't know who it is. Well, anyways, he's in Rhode Island. There's a lot of mafia out there. So he opens the door, and there's this guy in a jumpsuit, Italian guy, with these black sunglasses, you know, all golded out. And you know they always wear the jumpsuit just right above their navel, and everything else is hanging out. How many know you got your hair out and all of that? That's the mafia type of look. So anyways, he gets out, and he walks up to Evangelist Ted. So he's thinking, okay, I just got shut down by the government. Now I got the mafia coming out of a, out of a thing, but he just prayed. So anyways, he said, hey, man, what are you doing? Because the mafia thought that he was actually selling furniture without permission. That was his territory of that, of that area. And he said, hey, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm a preacher, and I, I got this up, and I'm preaching the gospel. He said, oh, you are? This is straight mafia, drug addict, drug dealer, you name it. And uh, he said, yeah, I've been hearing about you. And he said, uh, he said, so what's going on? He said, well, I got to pull down this tent. He said, for what? He said, oh, because the, uh, such and such told me I had to pull down this tent. He said, such and such? He said, I know that guy. He said, uh, I'll talk to him for you. And, uh, and Evangelist Ted said, oh, praise God. Thanks for talking to him. But he said, you know, the problem is the reason why that they're shutting down this tent because all the drug sales actually stopped and everybody's coming to your tent meeting. And he said, these guys are actually, I'm paying them. So I'll talk to them myself. So he goes into the office of the executive, whatever leader of the county, and he says, hey, don't forget, you work for me. Leave that preacher alone. So anyways, so they, they continue to have the tent meeting. That night, listen, that night, guess who pulls up? The mafia guy. So he comes up in his white limo, and uh, he comes out of the limo, and now he has two women with him. Now, obviously, these women are not normal women. Uh, they, they have 10-inch heels, and they're coming out, and obviously, you know, he's in the mafia. And, uh, and uh, they got some, like, cheetah plaid skirts on and all that. The problem was is that they had these huge high heels, and you know, like a tent meeting, you got grass and all that. They're like, you know, wobbling, getting into the, you know, <laughs> putting their feet in. And uh, the ushers usher them in right in the front row. So you got the mafia gang leader coming in a limo with two prostitutes sitting next to him. He preaches the message. The power of God erupts in the place. And what happens? At the end of the service, the mafia guy comes up, and, and he's in a full suit, you know, like mafia suit with the sunglasses. He's out of the jumpsuit and a, like, pinstripe suit. He comes up, and he's in the altar call. Then he looks back, and the two women are right there sitting there. And then he shouts out loud. He says, hey. You two ladies are worse than me. Get up here. And he grabs them. And, uh, and, and then the whole, the, the meeting went for another week in that place. I mean, crackheads, drug dealers, the mafia got saved. What am I saying? That's what we need to do. We need to take dominion. And whatever the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it around for your good. Can you say amen? The devil wanted to shut them down. The devil wanted to take them in, but the man of God began to pray, and God gave him away. I see God giving you away out of whatever situation you might be facing. Can you shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Whatever the plan of the enemy, it will always backfire. Somebody shout, oh, backfire. backfire. I want to encourage you with that story because, you know, that, that's, the, that's the reality is, is that the enemy would always try to bully you. How many know the enemy is a bully? I'll give you one more story before I go on my notes. There was a guy, this is hilarious, I heard this story. There was this little kid, little, little tiny guy in high school. I mean, he was super short, like four foot tall. And there was this big bully, like 300 pounds. And I mean, the biggest bully in the school. And he would mess with everybody and give them wedgies. And, you know, just, just mean old bully. How many know there's some bullies out in high school? So anyways, he's going around and beating all these kids up. And then he sat at his desk. And uh, this big bully started, he, he started writing down on a sheet of paper. And this little guy, I mean, four foot tall, but he, was ten he had some tenacity. I mean, this guy was no joke. And uh, he said, hey, bully, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm writing names down in the high school of all the kids I can beat up. And uh, that four foot uh, kid came across there, snatched the paper. He said, what do you mean you write names? Let me see that sheet of paper. And he grabbed the sheet of paper, and he started going down the list of names, and he saw his name on it. He said, hey, my name's on there. My name's on there. And, and the bully said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll take your name off of it. He said, good. And then he walked away and took off the paper. But, but what was the reality is that he looked at that list, and he said, hey, you think you can beat me up? Huh, you want some? Huh, you want some? And the bully said, no, 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 I don't want some. Let me take my eraser, and I'm going to erase you off my, my list. 
And that's what we have to be in the last days. Even though the devil can look like he's big and bad to the bone, but greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Can you say amen? Amen. We are ordained to reign as kings in this life. Not as beggars, not as like we're running from people and running from things. We are supposed to run into the battle. Come on, guys. We are the ones that can stop the winds and waves. Come on, Jesus is living on the inside of you. Can you say amen? Somebody shout dominion. So what is dominion? We've been talking about this. Dominion is power. Somebody shout power one time. Somebody say, I got the power. Yeah, you do got the power. It means authority or control over something. It's the ability to request or command. That's what dominion is. You have power today. I said you have, po- you have power over your physical body. You have, the- you have power over your feelings. You know you can talk to yourself. You, you know you can control the way you think? Do, do you know you can control your vessel? Do you know you can control if sickness is on your body, you can kick it off? Come on. that We have dominion. Jesus told us all power, all authority has been given unto me, and I'm giving it unto you. God has given us power. Everybody shout power. So this is what we're doing. We're taking dominion. We're taking over. Everybody shout take over. It, it's time more than ever in the 21st century to take over. You see the enemy doing its best to take over this world. Again, you see, you see through the different baits and the different things that they're using, alluring people to take dominion over people's minds. But we have the cure. The real church has the antidote. The real church has the vaccine. The real church has the cure to racism. The real, the real genuine church is the blood of Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the word of God. It's the double-edged sword. It's the hammer that can break the rock into pieces. We have the answers, guys. We have, we, have, we have everything that we need to make this world a better place. And it's living on the inside of you. You have a treasure on the inside of you. Not made with the man's of clay, but the, the, the treasure is the Holy Ghost living on the inside of us. We are the hope to humanity. We are the unbiblical core from God to the earth to make a difference. And I see you making a difference, guys. You weren't put here to survive. You weren't put here to get by. You were put here to take dominion. And you're going to take dominion in Jesus' name. Come on, don't be a pushover. This is not soft Christianity. This is the book of Acts blazing Christianity, and you're a part of it. Can you say amen? amen. That's, that's what I love about Pentecostalism and, and, and the fire of God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the, the churches today do not want to talk about it, but that's the core power of the Holy Ghost. What makes a Corvette a Corvette? It's the engine on the inside. Hey, glory to God. What makes a Ferrari a Ferrari? It's those those 12 valve cylinders that are pumping on the inside. You carry power on the inside of you. Say, Pastor, why are you so loud? Well, Jesus was. Jesus didn't sit with a little lamb and, and pet him and say, Hallelujah. Jesus was radical. I mean, he preached to 5,000 people without a mic. You can't go soft on a soul with a, with a soy latte and skinny jeans and a jean jacket and preach to 5,000 people. You have to lift your voice. You have to preach with fire. The Bible even says when Jesus preached, un- unclean spirits were crying out with loud voices. There was revival that broke out. Anywhere he went, he flipped over the city. I see that in your life. Wherever you go, you're going to flip it over in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, put those Baltimore hands together and shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we talked about this last week, but, and I want to recap this, but we talked about reigning as kings in life. What a powerful revelation. The Bible says this in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. Jesus, in Revelation 19, 16, it says, On his robe and on his thigh was written the title, The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We talked about this last week. You are kings. You are lords. He wasn't talking about the presidents of America. He wasn't talking about the mafia leaders. He was talking about the king. We are kings in this world. We have been, uh, guys, I'm telling you, well, Pastor, I don't feel like a king. I feel like, a, I feel like I'm, well, get renewed and, and allow the Spirit of God to continue to build you up. But you are not who you used to be anymore. Praise God. You, you are not from their family. Yeah, you might have a family like you went to a, a party and your family was there and all that. But that's not, that, in a sense, that's your family. But that's not your real family. This is your real family. Those that do the will of my father is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Are you with me? Shout hallelujah. 
So he's saying in this passage that Jesus, when he comes down, you'll see it on the side of his leg. I want to see if it's like written in cursive or graffiti. I don't know what type of, you know, Roman numeral, who knows. But it says down the side, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We have been adopted and you know you are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Woo, glory, hallelujah. The Bible talks about how we were, we were like a branch that was scattered on the ground, and then God engrafted us up. You, you know what engrafting means? It means when you cut a tree and you, you take a dead branch and you stick that sucker on there and you tape it, and then what happens? That tree begins to bring life to that branch, and then that branch starts to bear forth fruit. That's who you are, praise God. We've been engrafted in. We have been reared together. We've been joined together. Hallelujah. And no longer are we, uh, uh, I'm, I'm white, I'm black. No, the Bible even says that we are a royal race man i feel the holy ghost hey glory to god i mean th this dumb stuff that the enemy is trying to play everybody's mind with well all of us white people we need to stick together all the asians need to say no all the christians we need to take dominion and kick the devil's butt it's the devil behind these lies can you say amen we are kings and kings. We, we, are, we are kings of the great king. We are lords of the great lord. And we are a royal race. That, that's the dominion you have to take. Think about it. If you're a king, you walk different. Come on, church. If you're a king, you talk different. Praise God. Come on. If you're a king, you think different. Praise God. Hey, glory to God. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. I had to run around this room a couple times. Hallelujah. Woo, come on, dance in your seat. Just put some feet action. There you go. You are. Every time you move that feet around, you remind the devil that he's under your feet. Can you say amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. The devil hates. Listen, guys, if the devil hates any message, he hates this message. He doesn't want to know. You do, he doesn't want you to under identify who you are in Christ, your position now. I mean, that's what religion is. You know, praise God. You know, we're down here the last days. Praise God. Stuff going to get harder, can you say, man? The church is a preaching that right now. It's going to get tough, and boy, we're just going to get beat up, but maybe we can just hang out and drink some coffee, maybe get some beer and just get, get drunk and worried about it. Later. No, that's not what we're doing. We're not getting drunk. We're not going off in the world. We're going to go right into the middle of disaster and see it flipped. God is pouring out. He said, in the last days, he said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Come on. We're not going under, guys. We're going over. God has preserved you. He's brought you here for such a time as this to empower you to take dominion. And some of you say, well, Pastor, I can't even take dominion over my personal life. Well, guess what? God is going to begin to do that work this week. You say, well, Pastor, I got, I got sickness in my body. I got a kid that's not serving God. You start to rip your tongue and, 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 and begin to speak over that child, begin to speak over your body, begin to, like herb, he begin to speak over his situation. I'm not going to live in my car anymore. I'm a king. I'm getting out of this car. I'm going to get into a place. I'm not just any place, but get me by the water, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on, that's only the beginning, Herb. That's only that's baselining. I mean, he's only been coming here for a few weeks, and God has already transitioned him. That will be your story in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. So that revelation of being a king on the earth. Come on, get that in your belly. Hallelujah. Come on. You gotta get you got a new robe on. Praise God. You got a spiritual ring on. Come on, you got a spiritual staff when you walk around. You know, the, 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 the spiritual realm, you got angels all around you wherever you go. If you're a born-again, blood-washed blood believer, you have power. You, I said, you got power. I said, you got power. You got authority. You got an ability. You, you, got, a, you got a Holy Ghost unction on the inside of you, and nothing can be impossible for you. You, you are not the ant anymore. You're, you're not, you're not the, the turtle that comes out and sees an alligator and goes back into your shell. You have been redeemed as an alligator. Praise God. You run the river now. You're not finding Nemo and, and going into the cliff of the water. You are those sharks now, but a good shark. Praise God. Just don't bite me. Amen. Come on. You're not the deer that's running from the lion anymore. You are the king of the jungle. That's who you are, church. I said that's who you are. And you get that in your spirit, and you say, you know what, if, that is what, if that's what the Bible says, so be it. And I'm going to do this, and guess what, I'm going to reign for Jesus on the earth. Yeah. You know, I always think about making it rain. I think about uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Every time he played basketball in the 90s, how many watched Shaquille O'Neal? Every time he'd slam, bunk, he'd slam dunk that ball, what would he do? He'd break the hoop. 
I mean, he would literally, I mean, they, they probably, at first it was cool, but after like the 20th time, he said, okay, you're making it rain too much. Glasses of, a piece of glass are falling all over the place. We got it. You're 400 pounds, and when you grab a, a rim, you break it. So I think they like bulletproof the glass or whatever to get it. But how many know that's just like, like a, touch, like, I mean, just like a stomp in the devil's face when you come and just break the rim, and you totally destroy, that's what we need to do. We're not fighting devils anymore. We're not fighting demons. Yes, we wrestle against principalities and powers and all that, but they're under your feet. You, you just don't get out of your authority. How many know that? Yes, yes, there's demons. Yes, there's power. Yes, there's evil things that are going on the earth. But as you contend and stay in the secret place of God, he will cover you under the shadow, and that's going to be your place. That's where you rule and reign. You are seated high above all principalities, all power, and all might, and all dominion. Come on, if you believe that, shout hallelujah. Shout, I'm a king. All the ladies, shout, I'm a queen. Amen. Hopefully no men said I'm a queen, but we can work on that. Never know. We're in the last days, so praise God. <laughs> but I, I want to show you this just real quick. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, one of my favorite scriptures. The Bible says this in the NLT. It says in the last days. We're living in the last days. It says the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all. Meaning above everything else. Then it says this, very powerful. It says the most important place on the earth. It will be uh, risen above all the other hills. And people from all over the world will stream into worship in it. That's what the Bible's saying. The Bible is saying in the last days that people will run to the house of God. How many know that? Even in the 50s, if you look at Dr. Oral Roberts' ministry and other people, Smith Wigglesworth and all these other people, they, they had, you know, bubonic plagues, John G. Lake, all these things, and there was, there was cure. They didn't have cures for certain disease. How many know they're, they're just trying to wing it now? They give a vaccine, and then they say it causes blood clots, and they stop, and it's all over the place. And, and I'm not knocking medicine. I believe in medicine. I think, you, you know, there's nothing wrong with medicine and herbs and different things like that, not herbs in that sense. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyways, don't, don't smoke the herb. Amen. Oh, it's, it's for my eyes. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, but you can see that, that even in, the, in, in those times, there was many plagues. And they would literally, uh, they would have tent meetings, and they would, they would take people that are in hospice. They would take people that had cancer, stage 4 cancer. I mean, how many know when you have stage 4 cancer, stage 3, there's really nothing. Even today, there's really nothing for them to do. They pump you with a vitamin C and throw you through, you know, chemo. But how many know we have power and authority? And they would roll people in ambulances and bring them to meetings. I remember one time Smith, w Smith Willsworth had this guy come in, and uh, he had stomach cancer. So they rolled him up in the front row. Well, one thing you don't want to be is in the front row of Smith Wigglesworth meeting because he saw demon spirits and powers, and he would punch and slap people. And, and they asked him in an interview, they said, why would you punch and hit people? He said, I'm not punching them. I'm punching the spirit out of them. So that's how he prayed. If any of you want to go to one of his meetings, uh, you can enjoy it. But anyways, obviously he's home to be with the Lord. So there was a guy who came, had stomach cancer, and they rolled him right into the front row. Well, anyway, Smith Wigglesworth said, hey, what's wrong with this guy? He's sitting there with no weight on him, you know, like 100 pounds, you know, uh, pearly white. I mean, you could tell he's about to go off in eternity. And they, the doctor said, well, he has stage four stomach cancer. He said, okay. He said, boom, in the name of Jesus, Punched this guy in the stomach, and then all his vitals went down. The doctors checked his body and everything. The, the, the guy got wiped out, and the doctors was looking at it like this. And, and they said this. There was such a hush in the room. They're like, <gasps> like that, because they heard the punch of, of the pastor punching the guy in the stomach. And then he went off and preached, and, you know, the crowd was really mad at him now. Now the guy's pretty much dead, and he punched him in his stomach. So anyways, he's just walking around preaching. But you, you could tell that the, he lost the crowd for punching the guy in the stomach, which, I mean, you probably would too if you're a preacher. You shouldn't punch people. But anyways, he was punching that cancer out of his stomach. About five minutes goes by, and the guy sits up like this, gets off the, gets off the bed, and starts running around the room screaming at the top of his lungs. And then everybody's like, hallelujah, praise God, Smith Wigglesworth. That was awesome. But... Uh, but, but the reality is, is he knew that he had power over that, that sickness and disease. He had power. See, you have, you have abilities now that you didn't have before when you, were, when you were in the world. You couldn't take over depression. I mean, think about the world. If, if you're depressed in the world, what do they do? Take this, and hopefully it doesn't mess up your kidneys and your stomach and your back, and, you know, ask your doctor if this would be right for you. How many know that? The, the world has referrals, but it's not, it's not what the gospel can carry. How many know that? 
I mean, you, I think about it, even people at this altar that got healed. I mean, people, one, one guy Kerry brought the other week, the guy couldn't lift up his hands. He, he dislocated his shoulder for like two years. He said he had pain. And immediately, the, I believe it was two years, immediately the Lord instantly healed him. And he's been going after it ever since. I mean, there is power in the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. Somebody shout, there's power. there's power. I see that power getting on you in Jesus' name. Come on, I see it getting on you at your workplace. I see it going wherever you go. Can you say amen? amen. So again, I want to I get into this. Uh, and I want to recap on this on this text right here, this mainline text. If you look at it, there's this these talents that Jesus is uh, is giving out. And he says, you know, basic occupy till I come. And he talks about these three different groups. I would just say two groups of people. And I want you to get this in your spirit. One one thing he said was this. He said the citizens did not want me to rule over them. OK, so he's saying this parable, this earthly story that there are servants and then there are citizens, okay? We just talked about the sheep and the goats. How, rem- how many remember that, right? He is saying that there are citizens in the earth that don't want anything to do with God. And obviously, they're already judged. How many know that's not God's will for them? How many know that, that that's their own choice and people can reject Jesus? And that's, that's, that's on them. And obviously, we don't. Jesus doesn't want that. We don't want that. But that's just the reality. But then you have these other people that are servants. Everybody shout servants. And there are three different people. There is one that had 10 pounds, there's one that had five, and there's one that had one. And their job was to multiply their, their, their talent, the, the thing that God gave them. They were supposed to multiply till he came back on the earth. And I want to show you a couple of things and get in this, but reigning in the last days. I want to show you this, that time is running out. I want you to say that with me, time is running out. You got to get that in your spirit. Time is running out. As we speak, I just told you about that dream that that brother had about the earth spinning. This is the reality. The Bible says this in Luke 19, verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive himself a kingdom and to return. So when time runs out, what is the the time running out to? It's running out for the return of Christ. This is where we're at right now. There was a woman that came up to me, and a great woman of God, one of the members of the church. She had a powerful dream about the rapture. And in this rapture, she was sitting there, and, uh, and, and, and in this dream, she saw uh, basically like people not ready for the rapture. And she said she woke up in the morning, and she said, she, the Lord told her, she said, tell your pastor not to forget to tell the people about the rapture. She said, she said, pastor, she said, I would never do this. She said, I honor you, sir. I'm not telling you what to preach. I'm not telling you anything. And not knowing that the Lord has already been speaking that to me in my spirit. And she said, the Lord told me to tell you that the rapture is coming soon. Not to forget to tell the people about the rapture, the catching away of the church. There there will be a catching away. There there will be a lift off of people. And Jesus, he says every sign, every telltale sign of the biblical prophecy is actually already coming to pass. Everything you see now is actually, there's a a man who studies on uh, homiletics and eschatology, and that's the end times eschatology. And he said he is surprised that Jesus has not come back already because of everything that's in motion, because of everything that's pushing. You notice in the in in, in society and in in the end times. And I'll talk about this more tonight and I'll get more into this. But there will be a one world government. Okay, there will be a one world military. That's why they're attacking the police right now. Now, I'm not negating that, that they're pulling a taser. We know that. Now, okay, that person was totally wrong. I'm not negating that. There, there, is, some, there is police brutality. How many know that? There, but there, there's evil in everything. How many know there's, there's pastor brutality too? How many know that? There's McDonald brutality. There, and I'm not knocking. I'm not saying. I'm not. I'm not I, 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 my heart goes out. But there's both sides to every story. How many know that? Wrong is wrong. I stand in justice. How many know it? But the enemy would love to play a picture. They even did that in CBN. They, the, the kid that had the gun that was 13 years old, they cut the video and they pushed the video out and they showed him with no gun in his hand. But meanwhile, if you watch the whole video, he actually had a gun in his hand. It's still wrong. I'm not negating it. But I'm just saying, if you're 13 years old, you shouldn't have a gun in your hand. How many know that? It doesn't give the right to them to shoot, but you're, you're, in a, you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. How many know that? But the reality is, is that the enemy wants everybody to be completely in chaos. That's where the Antichrist comes. He comes and he brings peace. He brings a one world order. He says, hey, I'll help everybody. We'll all have the same money currency. There's no countries anymore. Everything's whatever the country we name it. That's why they want to break down the border walls. That's why they're flooding Texas now with people. And and I'm telling you, you say, well, that's wrong. No. No. Every, listen, how many locked your doors before you came here? 
How many locked your car door? How many locked your house door? Don't, don't give me that. People say, well, we should open. No, you locked your house door because you don't want people. You invite people to come in, but you don't let anybody come in your house. Just at the border right now, and I'm, I'm not trying to get politic, but it's just a fact. They found two terrorists that were coming in to blow up America because the borders are wide open. You can't have open borders, church. You can't bombard the borders. And even now, there are people, you're talking about a Black Lives Matter. What about Chicago? If Black Lives Matter, then why did all this money, I'm just going for it right now. Why did all this money go to four women and they bought mansions and no money came to the city? No money came to Chicago. No money came to the, the men that are in prison. Now, black lives do matter. How many know they do matter? But there is an agenda. The political Democrat party is behind BLM. The majority of money went to Democrat uh, people that are rent and the rest of them went to these ladies that bought mansions. Bunch of garbage. That's why we go to the inner city. That's why we preach the gospel. My heart, people say, well, you, you're a racist. Man, I, I'm married to a black woman. The majority of my ministry for 10 and a half, 12, 13, 14 years have been in the inner city. People are, people are liars from hell. And they want to cause a division. And they, they want us to get in confusion and get in bitterness and chaos. And then when Jesus comes, the Christians are not ready. Because you can't have unforgiveness and racism and bitterness in your heart and get to, get to heaven. It's impossible. But I believe God is raising up an end time army. Hallelujah. You say, Pastor, you're getting aggressive. I am because I hate the devil. I hate what he's trying to play on people's minds. I hate how he's pushing things. I hate when he, he slaps somebody in the face and he walks away and points somebody else out. The devil is a liar. I said he's a liar. He's a father of all lies. Don't bite in that garbage right now. Racial baiting, all this crap. The devil is a liar. I mean, you even have churches now. Well, what should the white church do today? Or what should the black church today? If you have an all-white church and all-black church, you're in the wrong church. I purposely, I, if I don't see other races, I'll go after them on purpose as a pastor. This is not some vanilla church. Can you say amen? It's like Krispy Kreme. You got every flavor. Amen. No, the, the church of God should be like that. But notice how he's playing these little stupid games in people's heads. That's why you can't get on this because they will paint a picture to cause chaos. That, that, that is what the, the top of the Illuminati and Freemasons do. Their, their motto is to cause complete chaos. They are devil worshipers at the top. You see the news artists. You see all these people. They want to worship the devil themselves. And the, their set goal is to destroy uh, humanity and cause everybody to fight one another while they go and do whatever they do and establish their own government. We are living in the end times. More than ever, the Bible says we should not forsake the gathering together. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Hey, glory to God. We should not forsake the gathering together. We should never forsake the gathering together. And knowing that the time is approaching, the time is near. We need, to, we need to look at each other and shake each other and say, we're going to get through this. We're going to take dominion. We're going to get as many people as we can get saved as possible. Jesus is about to crack the sky. We better get ready. You better tell your family, your friends, your kids. You, 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 you go to any place, anywhere, pumping gas, grocery store. We are on a mission. We're living in the last days. So the Bible even says the good side of this is to encourage one another. First of all, chapter 5 and many different passages said, encourage one another with these words. Not, not in a negative way. It's not like, oh, my God, it's a bad. No, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to get the heaven out of here. Praise God. You better have your bags packed, church. How many know that? You know, I think about it. You know, we went to Disney World, and uh, we were telling our kids we were going to Disney World because when we lived in Tampa, you know, Disney World's right up the road. And, boy, I'll tell you what, man, these kids, they literally, they have got their bags packed like a week before. Then every day they said, when are we going to Disney? We'll say on Thursday. What's today? And they would try to calculate the days. I'm like, man, maybe I can teach them uh, math and, and different things like that. The countdown of time, you know. And, uh, and, and sure enough, they, they had their bags ready. The night before we went to, man, they, they couldn't go to sleep. We had to yell at them. If you don't go to sleep, we're going to take the belt off and you're not going anywhere. I mean, we had to force them. They were so excited and so pumped to go to Disney World. How many know we're going to heaven? We're, getting, we're going to, come on, guys. Praise God. Hallelujah. There's an old Pentecostal song, uh, My Home's in Heaven Where the Rent is Free. <laughs> it's always like they sing it over and over. It's like an old Baptist song. My home is in heaven where the rent is free. 
And then it goes into another, how happy will I be? I don't, I don't remember the rest of the lyrics. But uh, it's a Holy Ghost drinking song. Can you say amen? amen? But how many know we're living in the last days, last times? That's why we have to get in position. I'll go on this in a moment, but there has to be an urgency. Me, me and Cameron were talking about, we said, you know what? We, we, need, a, we need a kick up soul in. And I said, you know what, Cameron, you're right. We, 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 we need to do like a seven-day, call it uh, Mission 7, where we do seven nights down at the bar down at, down at Towson or in the city and just blast that thing out. I mean, I feel the urgency. I mean, think about it. If I was in, I mean, think about it. You go back in your day in college shades, some of you guys, you were at the bar every night. Some of y'all that went to Towson, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to look anywhere. Amen. But, uh, but the reality is, is that if people in the world can go for it, people are dying and going to hell. I mean, think about it. Imagine if you died without Christ. And you just ride in a car and boom, you died instantly. You didn't know Christ. You're on your way to a nightclub or on your way home. Think about the, the tragedy of that. There's no returning back. There's no turning back. And we have to have an urgency in our spirit to move. There's an urgency. Guys, there has to be an urgency. When you wake up, when you go to sleep, you got to say within yourself, God, the skills and the abilities you've given me, Lord, let me take dominion to promote your gospel. One gentleman said on uh, Friday night at men's night, he said, Pastor, he said, I think he asked a question. Basically, you know, what, what's wealth really for? I said, to expand the kingdom of God. I said, you think about it. You can't bring any, you can't bring Walmart shoes with you to, to heaven. How many know? You ain't going to need them up there. Praise God. I mean, you can't bring your picket fence. The, the, you know, you can't bring, you can't bring the, the, the nice love sofa. There's nothing wrong with having a nice love sofa. But, but uh, you know, you can use that and pray in tongues and then hit the streets, you know. But, but the reality is, is that we can't bring anything with us except souls and people. And that's what this church is about. This is not a secret sensitive, seeker sensitive, you know, soft type of church. We're not like that. This is different. We were, this, is, this is why a lot of you guys are here. Because this is raw. Like, I was dying in this city. Time was running out for me, and I didn't know where I was going to go. And, and when I had an encounter with God, it wasn't like I was talking to a guy that was a Muslim that delivered pizza Friday night, and we were going back and forth. And in love, we were, we were having a conversation. And he said, well, man, maybe you need to read a little bit of the Quran. I said, brother, man, I'll do respect, but I didn't grow up as a Christian. I, 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 not really. I didn't grow up. I had an encounter with God Almighty. I said, have you ever heard God speak to you in an audible voice? He said, no. I said, have you ever seen an angel in your dream before? He said, no. I said, well, sir, all these things have happened. I do respect your religion and everything, but I can't turn away. I know the truth. The truth has set me free. I've been off drugs. I've been out of depression. He's real. I don't need to research anymore. All I need to do is promote the kingdom of God because we're living in the last days. Can you say amen? amen? Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. The next thing that happens, we're talking about time is running out. You can keep that up. But the next thing that happens, I said this on God's prophetic calendar, and you can write this down, is the rapture. Is the rapture. Matthew 24, 32. It says, now learn the parable of the fig tree when the branch yet is tendered and pulled down forth the leaves. Yet you'll know it's all summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things, everybody shout, see all these things. You'll know it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But the day and the hour no man knows, neither does the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But he says you know this season. You might not know the day. You, not, you might not know the hour. But how many know if you, if you see the clouds full of rain, you know it's going to rain. You don't know when. You don't know how, you don't know, you don't know, I mean, obviously you know how, but you don't know exact the, the, to the pinpoint second. And the Bible is actually declaring every biblical scholar, and I said this before, and I want you to get this in your spirit, but this is when Israel became a nation, a sovereign nation. This was on May 14th, uh, 1948. They just celebrated, what was it, the 70, 30, what is it, 70? It's 70-something, it's uh, uh, 78th or whatever. If you were born in 1984, do the math. I need some, some math uh, maticians right now. You'd be like 70, 70 what? Is it 37? Oh, is it? No, eight, 48, 48, 1948, 74 or something like that. Yeah, whatever it is. So anyways, the Bible says that this, it will not come to pass. This has to happen within this lifetime. Think about it. An average person lives to about 80, 85, you know, whatever, and probably even less than that now because of what people eat. But the reality is we're living in the last days. Literally, we're living in the, we're living, the Bible says in the last days. We're living in the last hours. We're, we're, we're living in the last grains of sand 
on time. And that's why time is speeding up. That's why everything is, is becoming the reality. And people say, oh, man, Jesus, people have been saying that Jesus is going to return for so long. And the Bible even says in the last days there will be scoffers. There will be people mocking. There will be people disobedient to the parents. All this stuff. Rebellion will be at an all-time high. They are saying that this will happen. We are seeing it as we, I mean, and I, and I say this over and over, but look at, look at cartoons now. Look at how they make the dad look like an idiot. Any authority, they want to turn. If the kids like rule, I mean, even like these little shows with slime and all that my kids watch, I almost, I have to take the iPad away from them because it's like the mom just does whatever. Oh, you want toys? Let's go get you toys. And the dad's like, oh, oh, oh. When it should never be like that. How many know? The dad should be the leader of the house. How many know that? And the kids should be under submission of the mother and the father. But that's what they want to do. They want to turn authority and they want to distort authority and cause rebellion, the seed of rebellion in the end times. But how many know we're not putting up with that? Can you say amen? amen. Somebody shout the last days. So you see that. And then Matthew 24, 44, it says, Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So he's coming in an hour that people won't think. And then let me give you one more, and I'll move into this next point. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, and they are sorrow, uh, and sorrow not, as even others do. And then it continues to go into the rapture. And it talks about how that those that are dead in Christ will come uh, and meet Jesus in the air, and we that are alive will meet together with him. But notice the Bible saying, be not ignorant. And it wasn't, being, it wasn't a nasty term like someone say, oh, you're ignorant or you're dumb. That's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying in a soft way that the writer there by the Holy Spirit was saying, hey, why don't you learn about this? Why don't you get insight about this? Don't be, be uneducated concerning this very thing, that you're living in the last days and that Jesus is truly coming back. And then you can, you can see so many more scriptures. But I want to get into this next point right here, is that we're not powerless. So reigning in the last days, where we talked about this a little bit, time is running out and we're not powerless. So you see the time is running out. Jesus said, I'll come back. I'm going to return. In this parable, he said, I'm returning back. The second thing we see is this, that we're not powerless. God gave them the ability to multiply. How many know that? God has given you power. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you have power now to overcome. Before you didn't. Before you couldn't overcome. But now you have power. And the Bible says this uh, on a lot of different things. But Colossians 2 verse 15 in the Passion Translation, it says this. I love this. Then Jesus made a public spectacle over all the powers and principalities in darkness, stripping away from them every weapon. Somebody shout every weapon. E, glory to God. And all spiritual authority and power that accused us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners and, uh, and proceeded uh, of, of triumph. And, and it says this. And he was not their prisoner. Uh, they were his. Look at that. They were not his prisoner. They were his. He wasn't in prison. They became his prisoner. That's what Jesus did. Jesus stripped away all the power. I want to tell you this story. Some of you guys heard this. But there was a dog named Scooter. And Scooter, every time he would get out the fence, his owner would walk him around. And some of you guys probably have Scooter or whoever. And uh, whatever, Fufu or Fifi, whatever your dog's name is. But every time he'd walk this dog around, he would walk them around, and as uh, soon as he got around this corner, Scooter would take off. He would almost break off the leash, and he would chase this cat, and the cat would take off running and, and jump up on a tree or whatever. And uh, so anyways, a after, after so many days, this cat got kind of messed, you know, it got kind of mad. Every time Scooter came about 7 o'clock, this cat would take off running. And the dog would just bark, and then, and then Scooter couldn't. He was just barking, trying to climb up the tree. Well, anyways, this cat, I don't know if he was having a bad day or what. or had enough with this thing. So Scooter came around, and the wrong day, it was the wrong day. And that cat posted up, and when Scooter came running around the corner, that cat took his paw out, stood its ground, and slapped it one time in the dog's face. And what happened? That dog went, Arr! and came back. And the owner was like, man, what's going on? The dog's all whining. I mean, that's his turn spot right there. And he saw a mark on his face. And the owner said from that day forward, when Scooter came around that corner, he knew what he was doing. He, he never went around that tree anymore. That cat just looked at him and, and stood his ground and was looking at Scooter. You come back one more time, Scooter, you're going to get a double for your trouble. What am I saying? You got to stand your ground. You have power. 
Don't let Scooter come around the corner and bark and make you climb up the tree and hide out in the branches. You need to slap Scooter around one time. Put the devil in his place. Can you say amen? Somebody shout, we got power. That, that parable is saying that he has given you the ability to multiply. He's given you the ability to occupy. He's given you the ability to take ground. You have to take ground as a believer. Whatever you're called to, I'll get in this in a moment, but whatever you're called to, you have to take dominion. You might not be called to plant a church, but maybe it's a business or maybe entertainment. Whatever it might be, you have to get in that place. And, and some of you can say, well, pastor, I'm retired and I'm old. Well, refire, praise God. Hey, glory to God. And then somebody say, well, Pastor, I'm young and I'm still living up life and all that. No, don't, don't waste your time. Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. Get in position. Occupy. You have the power. Somebody shout, I got the power. So you see, you see, you, you see that uh, uh, in that, that passage there. He said, occupy till I come. And then Luke 10, 19, which we, we share a lot. Behold, I've given you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. And by no means nothing shall harm you. Then Mark 16, uh, uh, 17 through 18. A lot of people hate this verse, especially, you know, denominations. They hate this verse because this blasts all the powerless uh, doctrine that people live in. But it says this, Jesus said this. He said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. Now, how many know people are demon possessed? The church was never a referral system. Oh, you have voices talking to you. Oh, there's a good guy up the street that you can get. No, that's a devil. Medicine is not going to get a demon out of someone's head. How many know that? It's a reality. So he says this. These signs shall follow that believe. In my name, they'll what? Cast out devils. They will speak with what? Keep reading. Watch this. It says, and they shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it shall not harm them. Now let me pause on this. He's not telling you to play with snakes. He's saying in the line of duty, if a snake bites you or a demon spirit tries to come, it, it won't harm you. And even poison. This, this is what happened in the book of Acts. Even Paul got bit by a snake and shook it off in the fire. Can you say amen? Yeah. Then it says this, they'll lay hands on the sick and what? And they shall recover. That's power. And that's what God has given to you. Even if you're a member, if you're intending, if you just got born again, that's available for you to take dominion. And I see you taking that in Jesus' name. Amen. The third thought is this. I want to give this in your spirit. Is that you have to refuse the spirit of fear. Now you've seen this parable, verse 20. Another one came saying, Lord, behold, here is the pound. And I have kept thee and I put it in a napkin. 21. For I have feared Look at that. For I have feared. For I have feared. There are, there are pastors right now that are afraid. They're afraid of what the government will say. They're afraid of the congregation. They're afraid. And it's just the reality. And we love everybody. I'm praying for the pastors. But how many know more than ever we need boldness? And yes, we should obey the government. But there is a place where obeying the government crosses its line. You say, Pastor, that's not true. We need to obey. Well, what about Daniel? What about the three Hebrew boys? What, what did the government say? The government said, we're erecting this statue, and if, when the trumpet blows, you better bow before it. How many know enough's enough? You get to a place where you, how, how many know the government in Hitler's time were wiping everybody out? You go down the list. There, there is a level where you say the word of God is now above this certain this situation. It's a fact. There, 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 are, there are outweighing scriptures, even the book of Acts. Do we obey God or do we obey man? We, we, there, there comes to a place because there is a satanic order to stop the church of Jesus Christ. Notice, notice what they did. They, they shut the church down for how many months? And look at all help. The moment they shut down the church, racism went to an all-time high. Suicide went to an all-time high. Debt and, and, and destruction of people's businesses. People jumping off of bridges. What happened? They closed the light of the church more than ever. Why? Because the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear comes and it paralyzes people. But faith energizes people. And I see you leaving this room full of energy and full of of power can you say amen somebody shout I refuse to fear so he said Lord I fear that's why I didn't multiply that's why I didn't take dominion that's why I didn't go and do what you told me to do because I was afraid I know how fear works fear is is a devil from hell it's I, I felt the spirit of fear when I left Tampa to start the church here in Baltimore I felt I heard the lies of the enemy well how are you going to get a building how's it going to work out where are you going to live 
what is this? What is that? I've heard those lines over and over and over, but I had to stand in faith. Somebody shout faith. faith. I had to keep pushing. I had to say, you know what, God? You have given me the power to overcome fear. I mean, even in soul winning. How many know when you go soul winning? Why do people not come soul winning? Oh, because I'm not gifted. No, that's not. You, you might not be gifted to sing, but you sing on Sunday mornings. All right, let me keep going. People say, I'm not gifted to win souls, but you croak like a duck during Sunday morning. Amen. But it's okay. If, I'm, I'm not knocking if you can't sing. It's fine. We all should sing, right? But you might not be an evangelist, but everyone's called to win souls. Whether you're good at it or not, we're supposed to win souls. So, so the reality is, as the spirit of fear comes and grips people from winning souls, from telling people about their faith, uh, uh, from, from, from whatever, even in church, people are afraid to go to church. I mean, it's the reality. I mean, you're talking about the spirit of fear. Let me tell you the story. I was at the barber shop yesterday, and I'm sitting there, and, uh, you know, it, I mean, it's a great barber shop, whatever. They're cutting hair and whatever. And there's a kid that walks in with his dad. And it's, everything's fine, you know, everything's great. And he's walking in, but you can just see he's so afraid. I'm like, what's going on? The moment he gets in the barber shop chair, he's good. And he's just sitting there. You can see his eyes. I'm looking at the kid while, I'm, you know, the chair's rolling like this. I'm looking. I'm like, there's something going on with this kid. And then the moment the guy barely took off the mask just to get his edge up, like around his ears, he started freaking out. He, he grabbed his, his thing and started going like this. I saw him shaking. And his dad was on his phone. His dad was on his phone, so he wasn't even paying attention to his kid. And I'm watching this whole thing take place. This kid is literally about to have a nervous breakdown because the thing fell off his ear. And I'm thinking in my head, look how they program these kids. In school, you have your mask down, you're going to get arrested. You, you, if you don't do what the government, they're going to kill you. They're going to arrest you. They're, they're pumping fear into people's heads. I mean, you think about it. They, they, they are in the news. They're pumping fear into people. They, if you can get people in fear, you can control them. That, that's why the people sell like alarm systems. I know a guy right now that does it. They pump fear into people. It's wrong. You, you, you ever thought about that? Six out of one, you know, one out of ten people get robbed every month or whatever. And uh, you ever thought of, and I'm not saying you can't get prepared and all that, but some people can push fear so much that they can get you to buy into what, what that fear, and fear mongers, that's what they're called. And we can't go by fear. Can you say amen? We, we walk by faith and not by sight. Can you say amen? I said we walk by faith and not by sight. We can't operate in fear. We're not fearful people. We're fearless. And people say, well, you got to be safe. Well, when did the gospel ever talk about being safe? Think about that. What about the book of Acts? These guys were killed. They were crucified. If you want to play it safe, then don't be a Christian. How many know that? But I'm already dead. It's Christ who lives in me. And if somebody kills you, make my day. I mean, it's, it's, like a, it's like a movie. Make my day. I'll be back. You could do that. I'll be back. I'll get you in the millennial reign, and we'll go at it. I'll be in a glorified body. I'm just saying. If, if, I mean, the reality is, how many know when your time's up, your time's up? How many know that? You, you can't turn from when your time's up. I mean, I've been, you're talking about the, some of the worst neighborhoods. We just got back from Chicago. I'm talking about the worst. They put us in the worst neighborhood. I mean, the worst of the worst. Flowers on the ground. I mean, you, people getting shot like no other. And we're out there, and there's no fear. Actually, I felt more safe there than some places in the county, but that's a whole other story within itself. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, honestly. And people were so hungry. And, and, and you can see people were receptive. The enemy will always try to put fear on believers, try to put fear and try to hold us down. We can't operate in fear. Can you say Amen refuse the spirit of fear. God told Timothy, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but God has given you power, love, and a sound mind. Stir that thing up on the inside. That's why we come to church. Church is a stirring pot to push fear back. Are you with me? I like the picture where they have like, you know, everybody is six feet away. And the, I'm just, I don't care anymore. I'm just, there's no filters now today. The filter went off last week. But anyways, just straight raw gospel, like tent meeting, Take it or leave it, praise God. How many know you need to speak the truth? I don't want to be politically correct. I want to be kingdom correct. If Jesus was here, if Apostle Paul was sitting right here, I wouldn't want him to be like, man, you softy, you. <laughs> you Campbell bowl of soup, you know. <laughs> you cereal with no milk, you softy. Preach it how you see it. Tell him what the Bible says. No, it's, it's a fact. They, 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 they say that the church is not essential. How many know that? Oh, yeah, Walmart, Costco, airplanes, all of that. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds of the mouth of God. Then they say, okay, we'll just go online. 
Oh, yeah, well, go put something on Facebook about homosexuality or about truth. You're going to get banned. He, you just got, he just got banned on Facebook and had to make a new account because he, he put a comment that came against the, the big social media platform, and they turned him off. So, yeah, get everybody on the media, and then if you say one thing, they'll clip your, they clip your feet. The church was not made to be on television. The church was made to lay hands on the sick. Nothing wrong. We have cameras. We believe people might not be able to get here. We believe in, in, the, in the television ministry. But there is nothing like one-on-one, -on -one, laying hands, taking communion, praying for people. We have to do it in the last days. Can you say amen? And don't operate in fear. Don't let fear grip you. That's what that guy said. Again, he did not want to multiply. He didn't want to move forward because he was afraid that he couldn't do it. Afraid, thought that God was a certain type of person. Not at all. If anybody's for you, God is for you. Can you say amen? I said this on Wednesday night. God desires to help you. Somebody shot. he wants to help me. God, God cares about you. If anybody's in your lane, if anybody's in, in, in your back in you, it's been the Lord. He wants to help you. He wants you to move forward in life. God is counting on us, guys. God, God is co-laboring with us. People are dying. Pe people are going to hell. And what's happening is, is because Christians, the enemy has attacked them with the spirit of fear. Oh, I can't say that. That person's going to beat me up. And the moment you say Jesus, they begin to cry. I, 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 love, I love how Cameron and these guys are going out to the bar. You know, because there's a fear. These college kids, they're partying, they're drunk, they're going to swing on you. No, they're the complete opposite. These guys, one guy he talked to, Cameron talked to, at the bar, uh, uh, right, right out the bar. I mean, stumbling, drunk, and uh, he's out there with a group of friends. And the moment he started talking to him about Christ, his other friends kind of walked away. And he started talking to him. He said, man, this is crazy. He said, I was going to church in New York, and I totally backslid. And then Cameron said, he said he started preaching to him, and he said he felt like his words went out and gripped his heart and began to turn his heart before the Lord. He said, Pastor, I was talking to his soul. I said, that's some good preaching. Praise God. And, and, and he said the guy began to weep. He began to weep. What happened? He wandered off in, 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 in the world, and then a Holy Ghost man that was full of faith, not full of fear, went to him and said, hey, brother, get back, get back to the real life. Get back to the abundant life. Don't mess with that fake stuff. That fake stuff ain't got nothing for you. Come on, Jesus is better than any drink. Come on, any relationship, any money, any of that stuff. Jesus will make a way. And what happened? That guy, I mean, he got hit by the power of God. But fear could have gripped him from going out. Fear could have stopped him. Even today, people are afraid. They're taking everything and they're hiding and hoarding it and all that. No, guys, we have to occupy. We need to move. Can you say amen? Let me give you one more, and then I'll give you how to take dominion. The last one is this, is that we need to populate heaven and plunder hell. That's what we need to do. We need to populate heaven and plunder hell. You know, Reinhard Bunke said something powerful. He said, I'm not, he said, I'm here to populate heaven in a plunder hell. He would talk like that. I mean, when he talked, he would, it, like, he punched you with his words. Like, his German accent mixed with African. It was all mixed up. But, boy, that man, when he preached... You could, feel, you could feel the Spirit of God on the inside of them. You know, that's what you're ordained. Why are you here? That's the question. Why, why are you even in church today? God, your mandate, your number one mandate above everything else is to populate heaven and plunder hell. You know that, right? That, that, well, Pastor, I'm, again, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a, I'm not a bishop. I'm not an apostle. That doesn't mean anything. Your job, I mean, think about it. People at your work should know that you're a Christian. How many know that? There was a guy that came to a meeting, and uh, one of the prophets meeting, prophet of, of Andrew Ted, and came up to him, and he said, uh, man, after 10 years, um, uh, my coworker, uh, or no, he said, hey, my coworker found out that I was a Christian. He said, oh, great. How long did it take? He said, it was 10 years. And then he rebuked the guy. He said, what's wrong with you? He's like, 10 years it took you? And the guy's like, oh, sorry. You know, but the reality is, what happened? It, it, he was placed there on purpose. I mean, I think about it even back home in Tampa. And I want to do this, too. I want to knock on every door in my neighborhood. And, and we, we all need to target our neighborhoods. But in, in Tampa, when I would, when I would pull up, I, 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 I went after every single neighbor. They're cutting the grass. I was going after them. If they're walking their dog, I was going after them. I just, I felt it. I said, man, I'm responsible for these people. And uh, it's funny. Every time I'd pull up after I preached to everybody, it's like they're mowing the lawn. Kids are walking. And the moment they see my truck come around, it's like everybody, they shut the door, lock everything, go inside, you know. <laughs> And I get out like, what happened? You know, it was like the Brady Bunch everywhere. Birds, even the birds took off running. 
Because I'm, I'm going to lay hands on a bird. I mean, it's just a rowdy. I'm going to go for it. How many know that? But, but the rowdy is we are supposed to populate heaven and what? Plunder hell. Everybody shout plunder hell. And you see that in, the, in that parable. God is going to come and stand before us. And, the, and, the, and this is what I believe he's going to say. How many people have you impacted? Think about that. For eternity, we're going to look back at the earth and say, man, I, I don't want to go back. To, I don't want to look back down on the earth and say, man, I should have did more for Christ. Listen, if I open that door right now, and Apostle Paul and Elijah and Jesus, and they all came, and they started giving out testimonies saying, hey, um, yeah, you guys should take it easy on the earth. It's not a big deal up here. How many know they wouldn't say that? How many know they would say, with every breath in your lung, with every pump of blood going through your veins, with every strength of your bone, use it to populate heaven? They, they would say that. With every moment, every, every fiber of your being. I know for me... The first time I got hands laid on me and got prayer, because I, I grew up in a Methodist church, and God bless the Methodists. But the moment power came on me, the moment I got up off the ground, God became so real, and literally, I became like an evangelist immediately. I wasn't an evangelist, but I, I operated like that. Immediately, I began to call everybody I knew and begin to tell them. I told my sister, I said, Dawn, God is real. She said, yeah, I know you're going to church. I said, no, you don't understand. He is actually really real, and he's coming back. Something happened when hands got laid on me. And I, I experienced the reality of life and death. I, re, I, I experienced the power of God in eternity. And I knew as soon as that came in my spirit, okay, I must impact eternity. I must populate heaven. I must, even Jesus said, I must work while it is day. For night cometh where no man can work. You know, and before I get into, the, into these four things I want to share with you, you know, I was, um, I remember my, my wife. Her, uh, her father went home to be with the Lord. Great man, great man. He was, he was called in the ministry, but he went into real estate and uh, became a multimillionaire. And then he got struck with skin cancer. And uh, just a, whole, I mean, just a, a rough ending. And uh, I remember we were at the hospice. We flew up. We were in Bible school, second year Bible school. We went up to go see him in the hospice. And, uh, man, you couldn't recognize him. I mean, he had, like, big, massive, like, blots on his face. And, I mean, hospice, you're done. I mean, unless you have a miracle. And... Uh, me and my wife walk in there. We, you know, what do you say to your dad? He's dying. I mean, it's like your last day with him. What do you, I mean, what do you, hey, how are you? You want some Coke? You know, do you want some food? I mean, like, you can't eat, can't, you know, can barely speak. So anyways, my wife, uh, my wife's trying to hit small check. Hey, dad, I miss you. How are you? You know, and I know she's holding back. I'm holding back. We're both crying on the inside because we're, we're, I mean, I lose my father-in-law. I just, you know, I just met the guy. I mean, we had started building a relationship. What a great guy. Now, obviously he's in heaven. So anyways, she's like, hey, Dad, because he was real big in the football. So there was a TV right there, and she said, hey, Dad, um, uh, let, me, let, me turn on, let me turn on the Redskins game or something for you. And then she went to go turn it on, and then she sat back down. Hey, hey, Dad, you want to watch it? And he's looking dead out the window. I mean, not even look. He don't even care about TV. He's like zooming in out the window, and he says this. I will never forget this. He says, all I want to know is Jesus more and more. That was his last words that I heard from my, 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 uh, my wife's dad. All I want to know is Jesus more and more. I believe he was sitting on that bed reflecting in his life. Did I really make up? Did I populate heaven? Did I plunder hell? It's too late now. I'm, I'm, about to, I'm about to skedaddle out of this place. Did I use this vessel, this tool to make impact? Or did I just kind of like live a comfortable life and, and was afraid and didn't want to multiply and all that? He, he was going back in his spirit and he was going back in that timeline thinking, okay, should I made more impact? And I, I, listen, that's why, I'm your, that's why I'm pastoring here. And that's why I, I shoot right for the truth because I'm responsible for you. How many know a shepherd's responsible for his church? And it's not my church, it's his church. But I'm responsible, the under shepherd, for the people. And if you impact eternity or not. How many know that? I, I, I talked to... Uh, I talked to Kerry. I mean, he cracks me up. He's like, every bus I get on now, Pastor, I'm telling people about Jesus. And I'm seeing Kerry. I'm like, whoa, man, you're on fire. I mean, it's getting in. The, you see it. It's getting in people. Hey, Pastor, can we go out sewing? I don't care. Knock yourself out. What do you mean? You're going out tonight? Yeah, me and a group of guys. Bro, knock yourself out. It's just the DNA. People are awakening to what's really real, what's really has meaning. I mean, think about it. People say, you go to that church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all night prayer meeting. Man, don't you get a life. No, I have a life in Christ. I, 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 I almost lost my life. Can you say amen? People think we're doing what? You're in a cult. You're joining services are so long. Yeah, but a football game is like five hours. Don't please, guys. I'm telling you, and I'll, I'll say this, and some of you guys have heard pastors say this. 
Don't tell me a heathen can go to a five-hour football game and tailgate for another three hours, or somebody out in the world can go to a bar. I mean, people don't go to a bar for an hour. Hour, they, they got three songs, and, and then they take their communion, and then they say their prayer, and then they leave out the bar. No, they're there till like 5 in the morning. And then how many know when the bar shuts down, there's an after party? I mean, come on, guys. I mean, we were out there in the world, 4, 5 in the morning. Sometimes I didn't even go to sleep. How much more for Jesus? Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Everybody shout populate heaven. Amen. That's what we're doing. We're plundering hell. The devil is getting his butt, his rear end kicked this year like never before. Amen. I want to show you this real quick, how to reign in the last days. I wrote this out, but you need to use your time, okay? You can use your time, and uh, you can make impact with your time. Remember, we have 24 hours in the day. When I, when I was doing, um, when I was getting married, this was crazy. I was in the shower, and the Lord gave me a vision. All my family were coming, and uh, I knew I was going to preach, but I didn't know what I was going to preach from. And as I was in the shower, I went into a vision and I saw, I saw the whole banquet, the tables, everything. I saw everything. And then I saw on people's foreheads, it was like a clock over top of their head. Like a shot clock. You ever seen a basketball shot clock, how the middle seconds go? It's like the clock is constantly moving. And uh, the Lord told me to tell everybody at the wedding that there's a clock over their head and time is running out. And uh, when I said that, man, I, you felt the fear of God come in the room, the power of God. And, and many people got saved at, at the wedding because, you know, we had people from my wife's family and from my family that weren't saved. And, man, we were just in Bible school and stuff like that. And, uh, but I want to encourage you, use your time. You can put your time in the kingdom of God. Any, any time you come to church, God will reward you because of your time. How many know that? I mean, again, I've, I've sat and I've told you the story. I, I used to sit in meetings all the time like this for hours. And uh, I mean, we, I mean, right now they, at the river in Tampa, they have church every night for like four or five hours, every single night. They've been having it since COVID started. Literally, they're at like day 300 and whatever, 60 right now. Every night, they only take off on Saturdays, but every night they have church. Every single night, week after week after week after week, full-blown Pentecostal, lay hands on the sick, cast out devil service. And, uh, you know, you could be in that time and, and, and think, man, I'm wasting my time and, you know, I'm, what am I doing with my life? But the Bible says this, if you lose your life, you'll gain your life. But if you try to gain your life, you'll lose it. And guess what? God can make up your timing. God, in my life, I felt like I lived like eight lives already. The places that I've been, the things that I've experienced. Why? Because I've given my time to the Lord. Whatever a man sows, then he'll also reap. If you put your time in the kingdom, God will give you time. Can you say Amen. Look, look, how, look how the Bible talks about how the sinner, about how his days will be cut short. But, but those that are the righteous, God will extend their life. He'll bless your bread and water, and the days, your days will be fulfilled, the numbers of your days. When you put your time in the kingdom of God, God will extend your life. God will extend your time, and I see him doing that in Jesus' name. Everybody shout your time. So you can put your time in the kingdom of God. You can come out soul winning. You can come out and help out in the church. You can come and you, you, can, you can do different things or whatever God calls you to do, but you can use your time to take dominion on the earth. Can you say amen? Yes. And I want to share a couple of scriptures, but Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 16 in the ESV, it says, look carefully then, how do you walk? Not as unwise, but wise, making the best use, look at this, making the best use of what? Of your time, because the days are evil. I mean, I think about it. How many you can go back in your mind when you were 16? Man, in high school, oh, my goodness, I wish I would have used my time different. I mean, I, I'm telling you, my God, I tell myself all the time, it's like you want to kick yourself in the rear end because you're like, man, I, I wish I, I, I acted different when I was younger. I wish I didn't do this. I wish I didn't do that. But the remainder days of your life, you can use your time to impact eternity. Can you say amen? amen. And uh, I heard someone say this. He says, you can never put God first and finish last. You can never put God first and finish last. Look at David. David put God first, and he finished what? He finished first. He never finished last. He became uh, the, the entourage or the, the, the top notch of his family, and he was the bread breaker for his family. Same thing with Joseph. Same thing with Daniel. Every man of God, Abraham. Abraham put God first. Abraham put time in God's kingdom, and God made him. I mean, think about it. We still talk. You can't even talk about religion without putting Abraham's name in it. How many know that? What about Paul? Paul was spending his life in religion. Then he got hit by the power of God. He used the rest of his life, the rest of his time, and, and, and put in. 
What, what was he saying? I press towards the mark of the high calling. I forget those things which are behind me. He began to put all of his energy and his time in the kingdom of God. And what happened? I mean, think about it. when you meet Paul, Paul, again, he's not going to have his head down like, yeah, you know, I should have I should have got involved in more stuff. You know, I should have went out fishing a little bit more. There's nothing wrong with fishing. How many know that? Nothing wrong with having a good time and, and, and watching a movie. But you can put your time to take dominion in the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? amen. The second thing you can do is this. You can use your voice. You can use your voice. We've been talking about this using your voice, sounding the alarm. You can sound this alarm. Ezekiel 33, 6. Every one of you have a voice. Every one of you have a voice. You, you have a voice and, and, and might not be on a mic and, and outside with a big speaker, but you have neighbors. You have, you have a grocery store you go to. You have a gas pump that you go to. You, you can allow God to use your mouth to take dominion and turn people's lives. There, there are countless people that, I, that I've talked to, and they were literally right an hour, maybe seconds away from committing suicide. I remember one time I went to this grocery store, and uh, I was coming out, and you know I had, my, I had um, Kyla with me, and my wife told me to go get some salt, pepper, or whatever. I'm going for hummus and chicken wings. You know, bad to send your husband on a, on a shopping route. But anyways, so, but I, I was good. I got, I got the salt, I think. And uh, I knew I was going to witness to somebody. I knew the Lord put on my heart to witness. Them. And I tried to, wherever I go, try to find somebody. And, you know, and uh, I can't get everybody in that thing saved unless the Lord tells me. But how many know you, you, you know, God will point people out to you. How many know that? Even in your workplace and, and anything. So anyways, I was going out. And the moment I was walking out of the door, this guy had like these bug eyes. He was like this. And as soon as I, soon as I saw him, the Lord said, witness to him. So I'm standing right in the middle of the door. You know, it opens and closes right there. I'm standing like right beside it. <laughs> People are walking past me and all that kind of move out of the way. And uh, the Lord gives me a word of knowledge about his back. And uh, I told him that God loves him. And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, well, you know, God loves me. He, he wasn't interested. And I said, hey, man, what's going on with your lower back? He said, huh? I said, uh, yeah, what's going on with your lower back? He's like, I got pain in my lower back. How did you know? I said, God wants to heal you. Put hands on his back. God instantly healed him right in front of the store. And then he was like, oh, my gosh, the pain's not there. He's like, oh, my goodness. And I'm like, bro, you got to accept Jesus. So, boom, he accepts Jesus. And then he says this. He says, I'm not going to do what I was going to do. I said, well, you're not going to do what you're going to do. What do you mean? He said, I was going to go into the store, steal a bunch of food, and then go take all these pills I got in my pocket and kill myself in the woods. That was my plan. But he said, I'm not going to do that. I said, man, let me, let me buy some food. He's like, no, 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 I'm good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm not even hungry. And he just kind of walked away. I said, no, 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 let me buy you some food. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, thank you. you. You did enough for me. I really appreciate it. And he turned around and he went and he walked away. And I thought about that. If I didn't use my voice, Mark, what if, what if I, God told me to talk to that guy? I mean, are you kidding me? What if I just, uh, I'm, you know, whatever. I, that was my head telling me. No, God told me that. I knew. It wasn't even like a voice. It was, mm, you felt it in your spirit. Go talk to that guy. I didn't hear a voice from God. I felt, how many know you can feel it in your spirit? God speaks to you in your spirit. You'll feel an unction. You, uh, you feel that thing. You'll feel an impression. The Bible, we, we talk about it even in, the, in, in, in operating the gifts of spirit. You'll feel an impression to do something. And, and if you don't obey that, that's God speaking to you. That's God telling you to talk. And you can use your voice. And I can tell you story after story. Another guy on the way home from church. We come to Walgreens. My, my wife's got to get something, you know, makeup or I don't know, something from Walgreens. And as soon as we're pulling in, there's a guy in his car way out in the back of the parking lot. As soon as I pull in, the Lord says, witness to that guy in that white car. I don't even know who this guy is. I mean, he's parked. I mean, you know he's not there for Walgreens. He's parked in the back just chilling. God knows what he's doing. So anyway, same thing. I, I pull up, and my wife's like, what are you doing? I said, I'll be right back. I, I'll be right back. I'll be back. And uh, sure enough, go and start talking to him. I'm like, hey, man, God loves you. has a wonderful plan for your life. He's blowing me off. He doesn't want to hear me. I mean, you could tell he's just, he's weighed down with depression. And then uh, same thing, operating the word of notch, called something out, and he looked at me. And uh, he had a pack. I didn't even see it. He had a pack of, like, uh, pain pills, and he flipped them over, and it said for lower back or something. I, I forgot what it said. And he's like, how did you know? I said, man, God knows everything about you. And uh, he said, it's crazy that you came and talked to me. He said, I just pulled over because I felt so much weight on me. He said, I'm dealing with drama with his, his, his uh uh, the, the mother of his kids and all these things are going. He's like, I, man, I, I feel like giving up. I feel like just like giving up on life. I said, brother, God sent me here to speak to you. And the power of God hit this guy. I said, brother, you need to get in church. You need to get on fire for God. What happened? If I didn't use my voice, what if I just rolled right past him? The, I knew, I felt in my spirit, God said, turn the car and talk to that guy. 
God, uh, listen, guys, as Christians, guys will speak, God will speak to you because if people don't get the gospel, they're not going to make eternity. More than ever, I'm telling you, I know this is a sobering message coming to a sobering stop, but it, the reality is, is that if we don't speak to them, Ezekiel 33, if we don't warn the wicked, the blood will be on our hands. If you see the sword coming, the Bible says, and don't blow the trumpet. He's not talking about a kudu horn or what charismatics use and blow and, and waving flags and all that. No, he's talking about the horn of your mouth. He's talking about preaching the gospel. That's the horn that he's talking about. If the, if the, if the trumpet doesn't blow that sound, the, the people are not going to be ready. But how many know there's a trumpet coming too? The rapture, how do you know the rapture is here? When you hear the trumpet. There will be the loudest sound we have ever heard. A trumpet will sound, and then we'll know that's when God is coming down. And the same trumpet, before that trumpet sounds, we need to blow our trumpets. Can you say amen? More than ever before, use your voice to take the minute. You can use, I'm telling you, use your voice. Even in my workplace, when I, when I work construction, I mean, I, I work with the most heathen guys. I could not tell you guys the stories and some of the stuff that they would say. So I said, hey, if they're going to blast heavy metal music and kill your mom and, and write devil stuff all over the tools, you know what, I'm going to so, I'm gonna get so on fire for the Lord. And sure enough, I started putting bumper stickers on my truck, my work truck, construction work truck, real men love Jesus. I had the little fish. I, I remember one day I was driving from Virginia over to the Woodrow Wilson's bridge and you know it's like bumper to bumper traffic and there was a group of guys in a car and they see me like with my arms out. I have tattoos all over my arms, sunglasses on and I'm bumping like you know Christian rap or whatever and they come up beside me and they're looking at me like this like what is this guy doing? They, they, they saw the bumper stickers and they're trying to like is this guy real or what? Is this a joke or what? It's not a joke. Real men do love Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. And we don't solve, we, and I said this earlier, we don't serve some soft religious idol worship. We serve a true and living God. Can you say amen? We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Come on, if you know his name, shout it, Jesus. So use your voice. Don't let the devil put a muzzle over your mouth. Don't let them put gloves on your hands. That's why the devil, don't touch anybody. Don't say anything to anybody. Why? Because that's how the gospel works. The gospel works through your words. The gospel works through your hands. That's the reality, guys. We have to lift up our voice. Come on. We have to say the king is coming. He's returning. Come on, get ready. Call your family. Call your friends. Tell your neighbors. Come on, Jesus. And get people ready. Use our voice. And I decree and declare that over you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, the next one is this. What can you do to make impact? How to reign in the last days? Use your time. Use your voice. And the next thing you can do is this. You can use your materials. You can use your treasure. I remember when I first got born again, uh, they were having a big conference. And I used to play the drums. And uh, I like playing the drums with Paul and all that. We have a good time after hours. But I was really in the music. And uh, I remember they were having this crusade. And they were looking for instruments. And I said, you know what, man, I'll just, I'll let them borrow my drum set. I'll let them borrow my drum set for a whole week. I didn't care. I mean, whatever. I just, and I'm not saying that you have to, you know, get, I'm just saying I had material that can propagate the, the gospel, that can propel the gospel. You know, we will be judged by our, our treasure. How many know that? We, we, God blesses those and he makes us a blessing to impact humanity. Even now, like I'm, I'm, I'm very soon looking at getting the stadium. Man, I, I want to see, man, glory to God. I mean, could you see 63,000 people from the inner city of Baltimore? Man, come on, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Could you see, come on, guys, the, the Cannon Yard Stadium. The Lord gave me a dream four years ago. I saw it packed out. And I was on, I was in the field. I saw, Fred, I saw it with my eyes, praise God. About to shake one of you guys. I saw it. I saw, I saw it. The Lord showed me, praise God. I saw it. Scott, I saw it. I, I, come on, imagine every, my God, every gangbanger, drug dealer, prostitute, rich, poor, in between, and everything in between. LGBT, BLM, Nazi, whoever they might be, getting them in a stadium and preaching the power of the Holy Ghost 
and breaking the yoke off of people, praise God, and getting them off. Do you not know that what the impact of 63,000 people in the inner city and shake the core of it? Come on, guys. This church is bigger than a third-story building. Come on. This is a church on the move. Praise God. Come on, we are on, the, the train is moving through this city. The gospel train. Come on, we are going to flip open and flip open doors and push the devil out. Can you say amen? amen. When I was riding around with the, 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 the sergeant of police, we were going around and witnessing the people. It was the most fun, funnest thing I've ever done in my life. Dressed up in a suit, bulletproof vest, and preaching the gospel out in the hood. I don't even know how you compare them all, but it was just crazy. I was looking at myself weird. I had a suit and tie on. I mean, nice tie. And uh, bulletproof vest, and she'd roll down the window and say, hey, hey, get over here. They're like, what, lady? And then I'd start preaching to them. I'm like, man, this works. I like doing this. And this is like right at the height of, uh, of, of uh, what happened with uh, Freddie Gray. So I'm thinking in my head, man, I'm just going to get shot. I, I mean, you know, call it, call home, and I'm, I'm out of here. But obviously everything was great. It was awesome. But I was thinking about that, and uh, I witnessed to this one guy and uh, this group of guys. They were all in a gang, and obviously, you know, the officer said that they were in one of, one of his best friends just got arrested for killing a man just the other day. She said, you got to talk to these people. I said, absolutely. Pull up. Let's pull up. Let's do a drive-by on them. Praise God. And uh, drive-by in a good way. Gospel drive-by. And uh, sure enough, when, as soon as I got done talking to them, all the drug dealers right there, you know what they said to me? They say, sir, can you get me a job? And I looked at them. I said, that's the question that you asked me? What was he saying? Can you get me out of selling drugs? I don't want to die like this. That's what they were telling me. In the church, the church should be at a position to actually help people get them out of that place. That's why God blesses us. That's why God empowers us. You know, a, a, a river is a channel. A pond, why, why do ponds turn green? Because there's no outlet. There's an inlet, but there's no outlet. Think about that. Even, e even as a person, if you're eating food and there's no outlet, how many know you got a problem? <laughs> Not going to go there. We can pray for you later, but... That's a big problem that I have an outlet. Are you with me? And God will heal that outlet. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Somebody shout good Lordy. Good Lord. So you can reign in the last days and, and by your material, by what God has blessed you and make impact. Amen. And then the last one is this, is you can use your gifts. Everybody shout your gifts. Listen to me and listen to me carefully. Don't say you're not gifted. Every one of you have a gift on the inside of you. That God has placed something on the inside of you, and you need to discover it. That's what church is for. It's to stir your spirit up to discover the gift that God has for you. Every one of you. And some of you have multitude of gifts. Some of you, some of you have gifts for music. Some of you have gifts for movies. I mean, how bad do we need Christian movies right now? I mean, I'm talking about raw, Holy Ghost, powerful videos. Think about that. I mean, you, you think about it, even uh, look in the demonic realm, like Beyonce, Jay-Z, always talk about this. There, there are people that had gifts from God, but the enemy stole that gift, confiscated that gift, and now is manipulating that gift. How many know that? Beyonce grew up in church. The Destiny's Child, even before she became Beyonce and all that, they all sung in church. They literally sung in the choir. Her voice was never made to promote, you know, shake this, shake that, shake everything that can be shaken. It was supposed to be shaking the devil's kingdom. Amen. 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 You have gifts. There is something that God has put on the inside of you, and you got to get there. Praise God. And pastor's going to get there and kick your blessing assurance in this church. Praise God. I'm going to kick those cheeks till you get into that place. Amen. Say, pastor, don't kick me. I'm not saying kicking you naturally, but I'm going to push you. I'm going to shake you. If you're called to business, become the best business person you can. Whatever that might be. If, you're, if God has called you to be a doctor, get, get going. And you think about it, well, Pastor, how am I gonna how am I gonna use my gift? Well, imagine becoming one of the lead lead surgeons in, in America, and now you're doing a, a massive conference with, with ten thousand doctors there, and then you then you open it up. What are they gonna say? You open it up, you know, the reason why I'm here is not necessarily my skill, but the gift that God gave me. Jesus is Lord. Before we start this conference, I want to pray for everybody. There is no way a, a normal preacher could get in a place like that. They won't even make it through the door. But notice, the gift on your life will make a way to give you a voice. There, there's a, a powerful man of God, Pastor Enoch Adaboya, powerful man of God. He had a birth or, or he had a wedding. And in this wedding, the whole entire Nigerian government came to the wedding, president and all. Guess what he did? 
He preached the gospel to the whole entire, I mean, I'm talking about high levels of authority. The president, vice president, all the government officials, the mayors, all of them came because he made so much impact. And he used it. The wedding, during the reception, he got up and preached the whole message. And they all came and gave their life to the Lord. How many know you can use your gift to make impact? I said you can use your gift to make impact. God has gifted you. I love Dr. Miles Monroe. He said this. He said, God looked down on the earth and saw humanity messed up. Then he created you and he put a gift on the inside of you. You know, I didn't realize, I didn't realize for me, there was such a leadership gift that I had even in the world. I can make people jump in bushes, get high off of drugs, whatever. I, I, I mean, obviously it was bad, but I used my gift. The enemy used my gift as a leader to push people to do evil. But thank God, God got a, had a grip on my life and turned it. Can you say Amen. And the same thing for you. Maybe some of you guys are gifted in media or computers or whatever. Do you not know, like even in the Facebook realm, do you know you can reach millions of people by putting a Facebook post up? I mean, there's a guy right now that I know, Kevin, he was just here with the dreadlocks. He, he's reached over, I think, like 4 million people on TikTok. People from around the world. Never, Not one dollar did he put in a boost or anything. But he gave his testimony, and now the thing is spreading like wildfire. Like four million people. And he's not even in full-time ministry yet. And he reached over four million people with the gospel on TikTok for free. He has a gift. You have a gift. You have to identify, God, what is my gift? What are you using me to impact eternity? I don't want to go and, 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 and take my gift and put it in a napkin and give it back to you. Oh, here, Lord, here's my napkin. How many know that? God's going to say, get that napkin out of here. He, he wants to see your gift expand, multiply. That's why we're in church. That's why we pray in the Holy Ghost. That's why we contend for the fire of God. God unlocked the gift of humanity to help people on the inside. Martin Luther King had a gift. Dr. Billy Graham had a gift. You can go down through the line of people that God gifted that made an impact. Some of you might say, well, Pastor, I'm a stay-at-home mom. Well, who cares? You could be raising up prophets in your house. There is a gift on the inside of you that God is going to use this year. Come on, if you believe that, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So let's run through this. You can use your time. You can use your voice. You can use your material. And you can use the giftings on the inside of you. I want you to lift your hands before we pray today. And I want to pray that God would begin to unlock everything that he's called you to do. That you would not miss any moment in your life. That that gift, your voice, your time, your treasure, your talents, that God would begin to unlock that for the end times. Come on, let's begin to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I command every person to be unlocked. Whatever's hindering their gifts, their time, we break its power now. Father, cause them to arise and shine. Lord, I thank you that their light has come. Lord, I thank you for testimonies this week. God, thank you for power-packed testimonies. Lord, of dominion. Let them take dominion wherever they go. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost follow them. And Lord, use them. Let people, let people get impacted so powerfully with the gospel this week at their job place, at the market, at the gas stations. God, use them in a mighty way. If you believe that, say amen. Wow, what a powerful service. Again, I'm so glad that you guys joined us. And uh, listen, before we leave tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to give your heart to the Lord. I want to tell you tonight that God loves you. He has an awesome plan for life. And let me ask you a question. If you died today, where would you spend eternity? Jesus loves you so much. And maybe you're in another category that you accepted Jesus, but you're not really living for him like you should. Maybe bitterness, jealousy, unforgiveness, something happened that shook your world, knocked you off the train tracks of running with God, but God is pulling you back on tonight. I want you to say the simple prayer with me with your heart and lips out loud. Why don't you close your eyes and repeat this with me say Jesus tonight I ask you to come into my heart to forgive me of all my sins to make yourself real to me fill me with the Holy Spirit say this with me say I believe that you died on a cross for me and you rose the third day and you're coming back again for me let me never be the same in Jesus' mighty name. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you. Find an awesome church. If you're ever in this area, we welcome you. 32 West Road, Towson, Maryland. You can join us 1030. And uh, if you can find any other churches, we can help you. Message us and let us know that you prayed that prayer. We love you so much. Thanks for joining tonight. I also want to let you know what God is doing here at the River Church Baltimore. Amazing things are happening already. 6,000 and a little bit over 300 people have given their life to the Lord. That's right. 6,300 people have given their life to the Lord. Many lives 
lives have been impacted. We have testimonies, even people come in the church that were homeless. Now they have a house or a place to stay in. God is just doing an amazing thing. Many things are happening here. And then also we got outreaches coming up, the food ministry. Tell us what's been happening. Yes, we have a food pantry that is full of food for the homeless. And every week we go out giving out food, clothing, yep. and things that the homeless needs here in Baltimore. And like Pastor Tony said, we have two, maybe even three outreaches coming up this summer. We're doing bill pays, we're doing gift cards, giving out groceries, toys for kids, things that families are gonna really need here in the greater Baltimore area. And every single outreach is gonna have a soul winning altar call with a power of God is moving. Right. So you can partner with us and help us to see souls saved, help us to see this whole greater Baltimore region shaken with the fire of God, and help us to see revival and the state of Maryland and all of America. You can partner with us to see souls saved at riverchurchbaltimore.com. And we thank you so much for your generous giving to help us get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. That's right. Baltimore is going to be shaken. The whole America is going to be shaken. I want you to pray and ask the Lord what will have you do to partner to see many souls get saved. Listen, we love you guys. Hope to see you soon. God bless you.